Just about every weeknight, my dad would iron his clothes for the next day while watching the greatest TV show ever made, Star Trek The Next Generation. And though I was supposed to be in bed, sometimes he would let me watch it with him, as long as my mom didn't find out. My very favorite, Season 6, Episode 15. Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Starship Enterprise is engaged in one of his many adventures when suddenly his mechanical heart fails, and in shock, he falls unconscious. Then, somewhere between a dream and the great beyond, the captain is left to reflect on how he came to this pitiful demise. The answer comes in a flashback. We see the young Jean-Luc Picard, then a new officer in the Starfleet. He's engaged in a brawl with some rough-looking aliens, and suddenly, the aliens stab him from behind. The captain, after receiving this terrible blow, falls to his knees. Now this is the reason that he had to have a mechanical heart, which would eventually fail him and lead to this demise. The captain then, after being stabbed in the heart, with the brashness of youth, laughs at his own misfortune. Laughs with a knife in his heart. How could he do that, I wondered? Could I ever be that brave? Well, this vision was painful for the older Jean-Luc Picard to watch, not only remembering the piercing pain, but in seeing the arrogant, young person he once was, in contrast to the more enlightened, well-behaved, and logical man he'd become. Not long ago, I took a personality test, and I discovered that I have a lot in common with the captain. You see, I scored 100% on thinking and 0% on feeling. This came as a surprise to my friends who seemed to have the idea that a thinker could have possibly have been responsible for some of my less than intelligent antics over the years. However, to set the record straight, thinking in no way necessitates intelligent thinking. My wife, on the other hand, scored 100% on feeling and 0% on thinking. So between the two of us, there's some interesting dynamics at home. Anyway, after I had this realization about myself, I, like the captain, found myself also reliving my past, and I was also ashamed. 1990, I was a first grader walking home from school with my buddies, when we discovered a new boy in the neighborhood. He lived with his grandma, and he was homeschooled. He was different. So we did the only logical thing. We made fun of him. Drawing from our rich first-grade vocabulary, we called him a foo-foo head. You know, it never occurred to me that I might be hurting his feelings. Because as a 100% thinker and 0% feeler, I just thought that this was what young boys were supposed to do. A few days later, we were walking home again, and there was the boy again. So I said to my friends, look, it's the foo-foo head when my buddy Ryan turned to me and said, actually, his name is Dave. You see, we got to know him the other day when you weren't there, and he's a cool kid. He's our friend now. To my thinking brain, this made no sense. First he was a foo-foo head, then he's our friend? Perhaps it was something that only a feeler could understand. From a very young age, I always knew that I wanted to be a hero, like Captain Jean-Luc Picard. And from that tender age, I was well-trained. That is to say, like every other boy and girl my age, I spent my after-school hours watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But I didn't just watch the show, and nor did anyone else. They played Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I wasn't like every other kid. You see, from the beginning, I was an original and authentic. My friends and I played Teenage Mutant Ninja Monkeys. Hour after hour, day after day, the ninja monkeys would battle an inexhaustible, inexhaustible supply of invisible bad guys, using our inexplicable skill for martial art. Someday, we imagined, we too would fight real evil. The time at last came in the fourth grade. My buddy Luke Benson and I were tired of dreaming our lives away. So one night... We slipped out of his parents' house and roamed the streets. I was wearing a black trench coat. Luke was wearing a black cloak. We were the bad guy patrol. 
We just knew that as soon as we found some bad guys, we would defeat them with our inexplicable knack for martial arts. We never did find any bad guys. Though the next Sunday at church, I overheard Sister Johnson, who lives right next to Luke, saying something about having seen some suspicious characters in the neighborhood. So I leaned into the conversation and said, perhaps I could be of some assistance. What do they look like? I asked. Well, she said, one was wearing a black cloak and the other was wearing a black trench coat. I couldn't believe the irony. We, the bad guy patrol, were being accused of being bad guys. It made no sense. Perhaps it was something only a feeler could understand. In fifth grade, I had my first real battle with evil, as personified by the mortal enemies of all young boys, girls. The fact that girls were our enemies had always been self-evident to me, as intrinsic as the knowledge that Dave, the homeschooled boy, was a foo-foo head. So I didn't need a justification, let alone a motivation, when I led an army of 20 charging boys at an unsuspecting playground full of girls. Many innocent girls were pushed over that day. I myself pushed over the chief girl, Jill Metcalf. Now, I don't know how exactly I knew that she was the chief girl. It must have been another one of those self-evident truths. And as I pushed her down onto the chalky gravel, it never occurred to me that I might be hurting her feelings. Then one day, I got my comeuppance. That is to say, I was taught how to feel, and I was taught well. Behind my family's house was the middle school, and behind the middle school was a big, glorious wilderness we affectionately called Big Rock. The reason for the name was that within the heart of Big Rock was a very big rock. Every last inch of it was covered in graffiti, for this was no man's land, a home to delinquents, anarchists, and teenagers. Another prominent feature of Big Rock was the old abandoned house. Most of it had been weathered away long ago. Now it was home to a scary old hermit that ate children. So my older brother and sister told me, and of course, they knew. But that's another story. So anyway, my buddies and I were walking through Big Rock, jumping along the big rocks and river and having a grand old time in the great unsupervised outdoors when we discovered a group of new boys we'd never seen before. They were different. So we did the only logical thing. We made fun of them. Again, it had never occurred to me that I was anything short of a hero. I just thought that this was how young boys were supposed to act. And as I've said, when one is incapable of feeling, one doesn't always make the best decisions. So I called them Snuffleupagus brains and other great inventions that came to me as my buddies and I held our territory. You see, there were lots of older kids around as well, so I felt safe. Well, this band of new boys, they didn't do anything but walked away in defeat. But on our way home, we discovered that our newfound gang of rival boys was following us on bicycles. There was no way we could outrun them, so we had to hold our ground as they surrounded us. Two of them got off and took my arms from both sides, while the other boy got off his bike and put on some brass knuckles. I looked to my friends for help, but they just cowered in the background. Come on, I thought, where's your inexplicable strength for martial arts? But truth be told, I wasn't feeling it either. As only a moment like this could truly reveal, I had absolutely no idea how to fight. The only thing I could do was take it like a man. So I looked at my soon-to-be puncher in the eyes and without saying a word communicated, bring it on. And he did. Bam! A cold, hard punch to the gut. It hurt. A lot. But they say that in moments like this, one's life flashes before his eyes. The only thing flashing before my eyes, however, was Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 6, Episode 15. And you know what I did? I laughed. This made my puncher mad. So he hit me again, harder than before. And in turn, though it hurt, I drew an air and laughed harder than before. 
Now he was furious. So using his full body, he drove those brass knuckles into my gut for a third and final time. The terrible blow knocked the wind out of me and beat the strength right away. For a moment, I saw stars, but determined to prove myself a starship captain in the making. I drew in more air, and despite this pain in my diaphragm, forced out a wheezing final laugh. Well, either I intimidated them or they were sick of me by then because they rode off on their bikes. <sighs> on our way home, I limping a bit, one thought recurred in my mind. I deserved it. But the story didn't end there. You see, we were almost to my parents' gate when we discovered that the boy, one of them, was on his bicycle again and following us right behind. He got off of his bicycle, and my friends and I were paralyzed with fear. We looked at him in the eyes as he said to us, Hey. And we said, Hey. And then he said, Have any of you seen my buddy, the one with the blue hat and the brass knuckles? No. And then he said, All right, well, see you later. And then he rode off. This strange interchange was so brief, so casual, so non-confrontational, my logical thinking mind couldn't make sense of it. Boys like us and him weren't supposed to ask each other for favors. And then I felt something. Maybe it was a change of heart, or maybe it was a severely bruised abdomen, but whatever it was, I actually felt for the guy. I realized that even very different kinds of people, foo-foo heads, girls, and bullies like myself, can be friends. From that time on, like the captain, I realized that as nice as it is to be cold and hard and thinking from a mechanical heart, a little feeling doesn't hurt either. The captain got a second chance, and so did I. I said a little feeling can't hurt, but that is, unless you're receiving some brass knuckles to the gut, then it can hurt a lot. You'll be glad to know that for my most recent personality test, I scored 2% on feeling. A whopping 2% increase from before. So when my wife needs a listening ear as she talks about her emotions in a completely non-problem-solving, purely empathetic, judgment-free zone, to some infinitesimal degree, I almost understand. As for the rest of the time, I'm more than content to be a cold, calculating captain of mixed heroics, boldly going where no feeler has gone before. I'm Stephen Gashler. Thanks for watching.